Hello, my name is Sarab Sodi, and I am ultrasound faculty at Cooper University Hospital and the director of ultrasound at Cooper Medical School of Rhone University. We're going to talk briefly about ultrasound guided IV access. So, first and foremost, let's talk about the why. One of the most common scenarios is that someone has attempted to place a non ultrasound guided IV catheter and failed. And they've attempted multiple times, and then they'll come and find you to do it. In that situation, the useful tools for you to know about are how to do it, when to do it, and where to do it. Um, this picture is, of course, an example of fake technique. Notice the person not wearing gloves, notice the poor position of the ultrasound probe, and notice the lack of a probe cover. But we're going to walk through the basics of how to place an ultrasound guided IV over the next few minutes, and then hopefully you should be able to get some practice so that you can gain proficiency with this skill. So what do you need to do this? First and foremost, you need an ultrasound machine. You specifically need an ultrasound machine with a linear probe. A linear probe has this footprint, and it's got a flat end, and it's thin, and it looks linear. Um, it's a high-frequency probe, which gives you a great idea of being able to see st structures that are closer to the skin. Anything deep, you're not going to see. Typically, anything deeper than 4 or 5 centimeters is not going to be very well visualized by a linear probe at all. Typically, an ultrasound-guided IV, we shouldn't be placing deeper than 2 centimeters in the first place, but we'll come back to that. The second thing you need is you need equipment. You need a all the blood tubing you might need. You need a connector. You need a vacutainer, start kit, and a flush, which you should all be familiar with from the regular IV access person approach. But most importantly, what you need is you need one of these. You need a long IV catheter. Now, in case you, as you'll notice, there's multiple different sizes, and typically the the teaching is that you want the longest catheter you can get. Uh, we usually use ones that are just about two inches long. Anything longer than that would also be fine, but you don't want to use a short or regular catheter as you normally use. And the reason why is because when you're placing an ultrasound-guided IV, the vein is typically significantly deeper. If you attempt to place a regular catheter in there, you might be successful, but the concern would be that there would be a very small amount of catheter left in there, and that would probably lead to higher rates of failure. But we'll come back to that as well. And then next up, you need probe protection. So you need to cover the probe to protect the probe from the patient and the patient from the probe. What this means is if you have a different patient, so for example, let's say you're working with, you just placed an IV in patient A and you're going into patient B. You would be carrying whatever pathogens you had on patient A into patient B's room unless you appropriately wipe down the probe and remove any covering that's on there. So there is a full sterile cover that's used. You can also have Tegoderm on there, which is something we don't typically recommend. Um, I would strongly advise against it. And then you can put condom probe covers on top of it, which work just fine. And then, but once you've got all of your equipment together, the next most important step is patient positioning. So the ideal is for your awake, conscious patient to be scooched over in the bed and for there to be a bunch of space on the side where you can go ahead and place that IV so that you have space to do it. Uh, when you place the ultrasound machine, you want to place the ultrasound machine in a spot that's very easily viewable by you. So, for example, if the ultrasound machine is here, right behind the patient's, right in behind the patient, you could be sitting in front of them, uh, in front of the arm, and be able to look straight up. What would have been even better is if we were able to put this on the other side of the patient and get an even better line of sight. Uh, but that's not always possible. This would be acceptable. This is an example of what bad technique would look like. You're placing the IV here in this view while you're trying to look at this screen. And unless you're double jointed in your neck, I don't think that's going to work very well. Now, there's a number of veins you can use to place ultrasound guided IV access. And these are all the veins of the arm. These are the ones you really kind of care about. Your cephalic vein starts off up here and it runs on the outer and the me on the middle to the lateral side of the arm. Uh, of the upper arm, and then as it runs, it proceeds to move out towards the radial side further and further, coming down here where it's colloquially called the intern vein, back from the day when interns were the only ones allowed to place IVs or draw blood. The other one that's a personal favorite of mine is the basilic vein, which is a large unpaired vein, and that runs just medial to the brachial vein and artery. When you're first starting out, I strongly recommend avoiding the brachial vein and artery completely. As a matter of fact, any paired structure that has an artery or a nerve right next to it is generally something I would not recommend starting out with at all. Uh, my advice would be to stick with the basilic or the cephalic veins, and you need to be able to identify which one you stuck so that you can then appropriately document which place you placed an IV. Once you think you found where you want to go with a vein, what you'll do is you'll put the ultrasound probe on the skin and you'll track it. 
What the person here is doing is they're sliding the probe up and down the arm and following a vein vertically up as they go, seeing the course of it. What that means is that if the vein was moving left and right or up and down, that would make it significantly harder to cannulate and stay in with ultrasound. But because this one goes nice and straight, that's much more accessible. You can also tell that this is a vein, not an artery, by the fact that when they are coming up, they pause and they compress it briefly, and it easily collapses. Now, the thing to remember is that if you are placing this IV, um, you can easily cause the radial artery to compress as well, especially in a hypertensive patient. So the trick there is to make sure that if there is only one vessel, it will be a vein. There are no arteries that run unpaired with a vein or a nerve. Okay. Now there are two basic differences in how you can approach this procedure. You can do this ultrasound IV in either short or long axis. What short axis means is that the probe and the needle are perpendicular to each other, as they are in this example. There is a needle coming in, and the direction that the probe is going is giving you this view across this way. So essentially the needle is coming in perpendicular to the screen. Now, in a long axis view, what you're doing is you're bringing the needle in directly under the probe itself. The difference is fairly obvious, is that you can see the needle the entire way coming in, whereas in a short axis view, you can only see the needle very briefly. When we first start out, I highly recommend doing all of these in short axis. That is the simpler approach to begin with, and the long axis has some additional technical challenges. However, there are ways of adapting this into your practice as time goes on. The next common issue is the angle of attack. When you're placing a non ultrasound guided IV, most people typically go in nice and shallow. And this works great for a superficial vein that you're trying to flatten for very quickly. But when you have a vein that's rather deep, for example, this one, what you'll discover is that you'll end up just barely getting your catheter down to where you want it. And then you'll discover that you've run out of space. This is a catheter that is very likely to cannulate. This again goes back to the needing uh, a long catheter in the first place, but also needing a steep angle of attack. By comparison, if you have a steep angle of attack like this guy, you'll discover that you have significantly more catheter in the vessel, which makes this, this IV much less likely to extravasate. All right, so we're going to talk through how this is working. You have, you're holding a probe in your, in your non-dominant hand and a needle in your dominant hand. You've found a vessel, you've figured out where you want to go, you've tracked the vessel up and down, and you've made sure that it looks good. You're about ready to stick. You put a probe cover on top of the on top of the probe itself, and you've scrubbed the area appropriately with betadine or with a chloroprep of some sort to make sure you can safely go in there. And you've put some, ster uh, some ultrasound gel down. You go ahead and you pierce the skin with the needle, and then once you're in the skin, you stop moving the needle. You then go ahead and you move the probe back until you see a dot on the screen. Now that dot could be any part along the needle because the dot is essentially just a small piece of metal that's cut. What you want to do then is you want to go ahead and continue to not move the needle, but you're going to move the probe forward until you just barely lose sight of it. Once you lose sight of it, you move the needle down a little bit further until you can see where that dot reappears. Once you see where that dot reappears, you're going to go ahead and pause stop moving the needle, and then you're going to move the probe away again. And each time, as you can see, you've moved the needle closer and closer to the vessel itself. Now you're going to go ahead and advance that needle a little bit further, and you're going to wait until it appears on the screen, the dot that you're looking for. As a reminder, when you see a dot that disappears, that's how you know for sure that it is a needle tip and not anywhere along the shaft. Once you've found the needle tip and you think you're in the vessel, you're going to stop moving the needle, you're going to move the probe forward, and then you're going to go ahead and move the needle slowly forward at a flatter angle. And you're flattening that angle to ensure that you can have the vessel, you can have the needle directly within the middle of the vessel. Once you've done that, and like a broken record, I'm going to keep saying this, you're going to stop moving the needle, and you're just going to move the probe forward, and then you're going to go ahead and lose sight of the needle tip, and there's no needle tip visible, and then you're going to advance your needle tip again until there's a dot that reappears on the screen. And you're going to continue doing this over and over and over again until you've reached a spot where you can't go any further. One of the classic mistakes people will make is that once they're in the vessel and they see the dot on the screen, they'll get super excited, stop, let go of the probe, and just try to thread the catheter. That will lower your success rate significantly, 
by following this very simple, very annoying step where only one hand moves at a time and you always find your needle tip before you advance further, you'll find your likelihood of success will skyrocket compared to the other fancier techniques. Once you've done 50 or 60 of these, we can then talk about some of the fancier techniques if you would so like. Now, back, back in my younger days, I volunteered to let one of our residents, who's now one of our fellows, go ahead and do this to me. So you can see that she's set up nicely. You can see that she's here in the corner of the screen. She's got the probe there with the probe cover. She's holding a needle there in her dominant hand and the probe in her non-dominant hand. The machine's on the other side of the bed and she has a relatively compliant patient right here. And you can see that needle tip starting to appear. This is a better view of what's happening. So once she pierces the skin, she was a little over enthusiastic and she managed to get most of the way down into the vessel at the very beginning. Then at that point she stopped and advanced the needle slowly and then the probe, and then the needle, losing sight of it over and over again. We'll zoom in for a little bit more view. So there you can see needle tip, vessel right there, and then there's skin and subcutaneous tissue. And you can see how it's going as she's losing sight of it, advancing the needle, and then catching sight of it again, and going on over and over and over again. And you can see the same thing continuing on. Now once you've done that, once you've walked the needle in the entire way, the next step is to take my practice is to take a look in long axis. You do not have to do this. You can simply stop and move on. But it is sometimes satisfying to look in long axis like this. See that right there is your catheter. That third line in the middle is a needle. And then you can see as you fan back over it that you can find the needle disappearing. And of course this is the natural reaction when you're done placing an ultrasound guided IV. A couple more things we're going to talk about. So let's go through some pearls real quick. First and foremost, classic mistakes. If you were to look at these two pictures, which do you think would be an easier catheter to place, assuming everything else is the same? The one that has this view, right? Not this guy. Because if you think about it, you have significantly less screen real estate, and any movements you make are much e more easily visible on this much more zoomed-in screen. Now, a, cla a reminder there is that this isn't about zoom, this is about depth. And I won't bore you with the physics, but suffice to say that if you were to put a zoom function here, what you're getting is an optical zoom where you're, you'll get a ton of pixelation and lose a bunch of data. But instead, if you simply have a decreased depth, you're just focusing on this area and you get a much better picture overall. So use all your real estate and then you want to adjust the gain so that black should be black. So the area within the vessel should be anechoic or black. And that's what you're looking for. Next up, you want to make sure you're positioned well. Preferably, this would be pushed over onto the other side of the patient, but this itself is fine. Use a tourniquet. This is what a catheter looks like without a vessel looks like without a tourniquet and with a tourniquet. Sometimes you might even need two tourniquets. And then this is my last reminder that what is often most critically important is where a vessel is. You can see this vein kind of teeters off to the left as they're tracking it. Whereas, if we were to go through this guy, it stays very much right there in the middle of the screen and moves very slightly left and right. Alright, that concludes the conversation about how to place ultrasound guided IVs. If you have any questions, you can always get a hold of me. Take care.